Hey, before I became, uh, came here to First Baptist Allen, I worked at a company called Lifeway. Uh, some of you might be familiar with Lifeway. You might have heard it's a, it's a bookstore, but it's actually a, a much larger company than that. And I worked in the training division. And uh, one of the beauties of working at that job is you got exposed to all kinds of denominations and churches and, and what they were doing in terms of spiritual formation and making disciples. And so uh, one day my boss comes in and, and slaps down these books, uh, the spiritual growing manuals from this one church up in Chicago that was like, everyone was flocking to it. And he said, hey, read these books. And so I reading through them, and something really struck me about these books is at the beginning of every one of these manuals, and they were given to people who are new believers in Christ, they had um, what they call their 10 core values of spiritual transformation. Every single one of these books had it right at the beginning. And so I contacted the church, and I found out that these spiritual uh, uh, values, so to speak, uh, were, uh, they, everything ran through them. They, every, all their programming, all their church, and everything. And and so I want to quickly read through those for you because they really struck me because of their simplicity and just right to the point. And I think you're going to see where I'm going with this in just a minute. So let me start. Spiritual transformation, number one, is essential, not optional for Christ believers. Spiritual transformation is a process, not an event. I love the organic nature of that. Spiritual transformation is God's work but requires my participation involves those practices, experiences, and relationships that help me to live intimately with Christ and walk as if He were in my place. This is the simplicity of these. It's not compartmentalized pursuit. Spiritual transformation is not. God is not interested in my spiritual life. He's interested in my life. All of it. Spiritual transformation can happen at every moment. It's not restricted to certain times or practices. I like this next one. Spiritual transformation is not impeded by a person's background, temperament, life situation, or season of life. It's available right now to all who desire it. And the means of pursuing it will vary from one individual to another. Fully devoted followers are handcrafted, not mass-produced. Everyone in the church, we would wish that they were mass-produced, but they're not. Number nine... It is not individualistic. Spiritual transformation is not individualistic, but takes place in community and finds expression in serving others. And then lastly, spiritual transformation is ultimately gauged by an increased capacity to love God and people. Superficial checklist cannot measure it. Every one of those deserves a sermon in and of itself. And they are, speak volumes. But for our purposes today, I want to take the second to the last one. Spiritual transformation is not individualistic, but takes place in community and finds expression in serving others. Very simple statement. Here's the truth. I wish that wasn't true. <laughs> I wish, you know... I know this sounds kind of strange in the business I'm in. I wish it was individualistic. I wish I could find out God's best for my life in a purely privatized affair. I wish I could sequester myself away from the world and know exactly what God wants me to do. It would make it real linear and simple to grow in Christ. Um, there's groups that have succumbed to that idea. They're called monks. The problem with that approach, there's several problems with that approach. One is it gives into your carnal nature, your fallen nature, that you can do it all by yourself. And we celebrate independence everywhere, don't we? We strive for it. We, we, it's a virtue. Unfortunately, in the spiritual world, it's not. The second problem with that approach that I think would be really great if it was that way is there's not a shred of biblical proof that would suggest that. Now, I realize in this group, I'm probably preaching to the choir this morning about what I'm about to say, but it, it's a very simplistic message because I'm a simple person. I'm not smart. That God has wired, for whatever reason, and you can ask Him when you get there, He has wired into spiritual transformation, the transformation of your soul and my soul, the necessity of groups, community, and relationships. And there's no exception. I know some of you go, no, 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 no. If you knew me, you'd know I, I can grow apart from God. Nope. 
There's not one exception in here. Now, let's think about this practically. Um, it's easy to think incorrectly about ourselves when we get alone, is it not? We tend to think we're far more spiritual when we're not around people. Let me give you a practical example. Let's say this afternoon you go home and watch a Hallmark movie or some sappy movie or something. And you're watching this movie and you're welled up with compassion and tears and, and love. And you just think, man, I am, gosh, I'm a compassionate, spirit-filled person. And then Monday morning comes, Right? And you're thrust into a situation where you got to deal with an annoying employee, person, or whatever, and you quickly find out how much transformation you truly need. It's not till we get into relationships and community that we realize how bad we really are. I've said this to my group several times. I thought I was a good guy until I got married and had kids. I saw dark places in my heart in terms of anger, pride, selfishness, control. I never thought I was a controlling person until I had kids. I would have never seen those things in my heart if I had, never, if I had just sequestered myself off from the world. The first thing I want to demonstrate this morning is going to be a flash of the obvious, okay? And this is not original with me. In fact, it's going to come off as almost common sense, but I want to pause and just show to you and demonstrate to you that if you look at your life and you're honest and you're a Christ follower, you live your life, your spiritual journey in four distinct groups, okay? And I also want to demonstrate the health in one group is going to determine the health in the next group. Let me show you. The first group, yeah, this is a group, guys. You, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is a group that you can drop in at any day, any time, any moment, and it's best you're in this group at least once a day. I know this might sound kind of cheesy, but when, when I am doing my devotion time, I think of a community. I think of the Son, God the Son. In Hebrews, it tells me that He is constantly interceding for me on the Father. And let me tell you, He's got a lot of work. The Holy Spirit, I find, is, is grieved. I can grieve the Holy Spirit. I can quench the Holy Spirit. And He's a counselor. And then I have the Father who I'm told to pray to, who has compassion and kindness. And I see the Trinity as a group that I can come into at any time, any place. Just before you think about it, God existed in a community before He created anything. The next group family and me. You know, even if you're single, you still have an extended family. Everybody at some point in their life is going to find them in themselves in this group, right? And this group actually is, is tasked with the heavy lifting of spiritual transformation in the lives of most of the people we see around us. Uh, whether that's a parent discipling their children or a spouse encouraging each other. Health in that core group generally speaking, leads to health in the next group. And so our third group is God, uh, or you and other believers. And that's the church. That's the church group. Okay, this makes sense. This is common sense. And again, this isn't original with me by any means. And then the last group, you and the lost world, the unchurched. The healthy Christian life is lived in four groups. And health in one group generally leads to health in the other group. This is what I find myself doing, and I'm going to actually speak against this in just a second. We often try to convince people, you need to be around lost people. You need to be working. But the problem is, is they don't have that inner group right. And we try to convince people to get into a group, but the reality is, is they're not healthy on an individual God level, and they're, in a they're healthy in a family level. And so we find ourselves often kicking ourselves. And if you notice, the spiritual life lived healthily I don't know if that's a word, is always outward. It emanates outward toward relationships. Now, I am not here to talk about group one, group two, or group four. That would, those are Jimmy's and Chad have preached on that to a, a great degree. I want to talk about group three, other Christians and me. And I want to spend the rest of my time speaking to something that most of you probably are in a group 
And so you hopefully will be able to um, relate to what I'm talking about. However, before I get into the reasons why I think you should be in a group, I want to say one thing because sometimes there's a, there's a myriad of experiences or a spectrum of experiences in a group this size. There's some of you out there, and I've talked to you, who group means nothing to you. I can take it or leave it. I mean, if, it, if, if I never was in a group again, my life would be fine. It's, it's either neither here nor there. And then there's some people that they can't imagine their life without their group. They, they can't imagine the trajectory of their life if they didn't have these relationships, the decisions they would have made, the things they would have done if they didn't have their group. And, I, and I, those are, there's a lot of those people. The group is just, I can't imagine my life without it. And then there's this last group that, and I realize I'm, just, I'm all over the map here, but some of the greatest relational pain happen in a church group. So I realize there's a spectrum of experiences when it comes to group. You're like, Ross, I didn't have that. I didn't experience that. Um, I am committed to God changing us through group very much like I'm committed to my marriage. There's seasons where it's great. It's clicking. And then there's seasons where it's work. But despite that, I'm committed to what God can do when you put people in groups together. Now, I want to give you five reasons. I, the bulletin will have four. Um, I must have added another one after they printed the bulletin. I guess you can do that when you're preaching. Um, I want to give you five reasons why I think you should be in a group. And again, if you're in a group, great. Just, I hope this, this encourages you. Uh, and, and here's the reality. If I was doing this sermon next week, I'd probably have five different answers. There's a myriad of reasons why you should be in a group. Uh, and if I had several of you come up here one by one and give your testimony, you would all have these reasons. So these are my five. Again, in a week from now, I could probably give you five different other ones. The first one is one of the first things the Holy Spirit did when He descended down to earth was He put people into groups on the first day. Literally, there was the proclamation of the gospel through Peter. Speaking of tongues, it's a whole other talk. And then he forms the church, and then he begins to break them into groups. Acts 2.42, all believers were together and had everything in common. Well, that's a, there was unity that quick. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone. First, two, two, two things you see is unity, and it impacted their money. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. You want to find out what's important to God? Find out what he does first. He quickly put them into groups. I'm always kind of taken back by people who visit our church, and if you're one of them, I'm sorry, who uh, will be here for months, sometimes uh, weeks or months, and I'll approach them, and I go, hey, is, is it time to dig, you know, stick your toe in the water and try a group? Nope, we're going to give it a little more time. That's not at all what we see in the New Testament. We see God immediately placing people in the groups because He knew that is where they would grow spiritually long term. Second reason. Small groups typically are an on-ramp to all kinds of next steps spiritually. You know, people often think we try to get you into groups for numbers. I have seen that when people get into groups, it's, it's like the proverbial domino. That gets knocked down and all kinds of other things begin to happen in their life. And that's what God's called me to do is see spiritual transformation in the life of people. One of the most common areas that I see that happens relatively quickly is spiritual gifts. I was told in seminary to find out if you have a spiritual gift, you're supposed to take a test and read a book. And, and you can do that, but I have found that, that the best place to discover your shape and the way God's melding you and molding you and working through you, and this is a biblical fact, you have a ministry, is in the life of of a group and other relationships. It's the sweet spot of service. Let me give you just a, a handful of some of the ministries that are mentioned in the New Testament. Okay, There's, there's several of them. I'm just give you a, a smattering. There's several lists of them. Um, serving. Who can't do that? Uh, helps is a spiritual gift, spiritual ministry in the New Testament. Helps. Teaching, leading, administration, Mercy, encouragement. Where do these happen in the life? Where do you, 
Let me take one of them, just administration. Someone comes in, hey man, Ross, I've got the gift of administration. I'm glad you do. We've got an administrator of our church. We have one paid. He's hired. But I got, I tell you what, I know of about 50, 60 other opportunities in the life of our church that groups that need an administrator on several levels. Just simply based on opportunity and frequency, this is where you're going to find your ministry. And every one of you has one. The second thing we find, so you, you find yourself best life on mission in a group. The second one is, is again, I'm a simple guy. This is what I see. I'm just relating this to you. When people come into a group, their faithfulness to the church skyrockets in all kinds of areas. And you're like, well, you're supposed to have that happen. You're into numbers. No. Let me give you an example, and I'm going to cite numbers here. Let's say we have two guests today. And we, they've actually, we've had two guests, and I, I sit them down, one right here and one right here. This one on my left never makes it out of this room. Loves this church, loves Chad, loves the preaching, just loves the, where, loves every, maybe does a few ministries here and there, but they never make it out of the worship service, okay? And, and, and let me tell you, we've got them. I can tell you, we've got le- several of them. And then we have this person right here. They go to group, and they go to uh, the worship service. In five years, statistically, according to Tom Rainer in his book, High Expectations, this guy has a 17% chance of being here at the church, the one who never leaves the worship service. The one who stays and goes to worship and goes to group, it skyrockets to 82%. That's just shrewd thinking, right? Get them into a group. It's common sense. You can leave this group right here and no one will know. You can come and go and no one will miss you. You got total anonymity in here. And some people like that, and I realize that's one of their steps in spiritual growth. Um, so, there's a lot more I want to say that. Number three, let's move on. Groups can be a guardrail to sin and just some bad decisions. I have found that in some cases that the last line of defense before someone makes a really bad decision is their group life. Now, this typically is true in groups that are smaller and there's a more compressed uh, accountability and they've been with each other a long time, but I have found that sometimes the last deterrent to sin and just bad calls in your life and judgment is a group. One of the other things I've noticed is one of the first casualties of sin, outward casualties, is they give up group. Now, there's lots of other things that happen before that, before that that, that domino falls. But one one of the things I've noticed is when they give up group, something's going on in their life. And typically, they'll give you answers like sports, life, all these other things. But if you drill down on some of these issues, there's really something going on behind the scenes. And group is the first outward sign. I say it's the canary in the mine. You know what a canary is? They send a canary down into the mine to find out if there's gas and something's dead. The, when they give up group, that's the canary in the mine. Let me demonstrate this uh, indirectly through a few verses. Galatians 6.1. This is ground zero for counseling, is Galatians 6. One of my favorite passages, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit, or you who are spiritual, depending on your translation, should restore that person gently. Notice it says don't send them to a counselor. You who are spiritual. The picture is, and we've all been there, is you're caught in sin. It's, it's almost like the picture, you're caught in an unintentional, you, don't even might, you, don't even, you might not even be aware of it. This verse assumes a couple things. One, there's someone who's spiritual that notices it. You've got to be around spiritual people. Two, that you have a spiritual person around you, and they notice that you're sinning. This assumes group or assumes relationships, that you're close enough to people where they're going to catch it. You're not in a group and you're not in close relationships. Your only other hope is that spiritual person's in your family. And if they're not, you're really out of luck. 1 John 1.7, now this deals with it a little in a more of an indirect way. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. John loves to talk about light. One of his uh, kind of his um, calling cards is walking in the light is a term that he would use to describe someone who's walking with God. I mean, you, are, you, are in the, you are in the dead center of God's will when you're walking in the light. It's just this massive term to talk about the spirit-filled life. Look what he says is the first indicator that you're walking in the light. You read your Bible a lot. Nope. You give a lot of money. Nope. You, you pray a lot. See, those are the things I would put. What does he say? You have fellowship with one another. John wrote this at the end of his life. He's probably in his early 90s. And he says the number one indicator that you're walking right with God is look at your relationships. That's not fair. Do you have fellowship with one another? And then lastly, as I move out of this one, you can't have a a talk on groups without quoting Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 24 and 25. Now, this is ground zero for groups. You've got to talk about this one, so I had to throw this one in. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day, capital D, approaching. Just a simple question. There's a lot going on there. Does your group, do you walk out of your group, just generally speaking, feeling like you're spurred on toward love and good deeds. Where else does that happen in the course of your week? Are you convicted when you come out of your group to do that? I had a friend who had a, a, served at a cowboy church not too far from here, and they called their small groups spur groups. You get it? Spur. You guys don't see that? Spur one another? Okay, sorry. Cowboy church, spurs. All righty. You know, what's interesting about this passage is they already are in the habit of skipping. Some are you in the habit of not coming, meeting together. 2,000 years ago, they already were starting to do that. You know, what's, you know what's interesting about this passage? What is the, the reason he gives to encourage them not to skip their group or their church in this case? Is that the day is coming. Okay, the day, capital D, you think they're talking about Sunday? No, they're talking about the coming of our Lord. And and here's the thing, just just you can all relate to this. When Jesus comes back, you want to be in his will, right? Huh? You don't want to be ashamed and have to and, and that's the motivation they're using. When Jesus comes back, you don't want to be skipping group. You don't want to be skipping church. Okay, this was written two thousand years ago. So how much more today, two thousand years later, can we use this as a motivation for people to come to group? They were thinking it was going to happen any day now, and that was their motivation. Don't skip, because Jesus is coming back. Dad's coming back. Point four. I, uh, when I was work, uh, writing out my sermon, and I, sometimes I share what I'm getting ready to talk to with Jill. Sometimes she's a good filter. A lot of times she's a good filter for what I'm about to say. Uh, that's not good. I wouldn't say that. And uh, anyway, I go through my points with my sermon, and she just looked at me like incredulous, like you have nothing on suffering. I was like, good point. I, it just didn't occur to me. Uh, but point four: somebody to celebrate with and somebody to mourn with. Do you have people in your life, in your church, who really are happy when something happens in your life? Not the, oh, great, you know, I mean, really happy when something goes well. Do you? Do you have somebody who truly hurts when you hurt? Hey, because I'm telling you guys, and everybody in this, old enough in this, your life's going to break you. It's just a matter of time. 2 Corinthians 2, 3 says, Praise be to God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. I often tell people, if the only people comforting you is me and Chad and Jimmy and Lisa and Chris or Allison, you are in trouble. 
I have seen people go through difficult situations that have no relationship and have no group, and they're like praying, God, comfort me. And God can, but chances are they have cut themselves off from plan A of God comforting them. It's through the body of Christ. It's through a word. And some people go, oh, you know, I, I, th- I think the people think they're going to pray and some kind of like warm fuzzy comes down. God's like, no, I'm going to use somebody else. According to this verse, it's paid forward. And so if you're not in a group, you cut yourself off of one of the primary ways God's going to minister to you. And I think we've already demonstrated that with Galatians 6.1. This is clearly the case in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 3, and then of course Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Now, I'm going to try to end on a, a, a very pragmatic benefit of being in a group. And that, it's just healthier. Ironically, this, there is a ton of data on this. Uh, books, this is where the lost world would actually agree with us on groups is there is a tremendous amount of health benefits of being in a group. Let me read a few of them to you. You can Google these. You can find these are well documented. People who are not in a group are twice as likely to die in the next year as those who are in a group. People who have strong social connections but poor health habits such as bad eating, no exercise, smoking, etc., have the same lifespans as those who have good health habits but weak social connections. The writer of that one said, the point of this one, it's better to eat Twinkies with friends than eat broccoli alone. <laughs> it's cute, isn't it? If you want to read more about this, uh, there's a great book that came out a few years back called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Great read. In that book, he tells a story of a, uh, a, a town in Pennsylvania uh, in this last century where all these Italians from this one uh, area of Italy immigrated to this town in Pennsylvania, and they made up the whole town. If you guys have read this, it's a great story. Well, these people in this town had the highest lifespans of any group, any town in the whole state, of Pen- actually in the whole Northeast. And they... And so they sent all these researchers in to find out why are these people living longer. Well, they found out they, they smoked, they drank, they ate terrible food, they didn't exercise, but you know what they did every night? They came together as a community every night and hung out and shot the bull. And that, that's the only thing they could identify that was different with this group. You can read about it in his book. Let me end with this. One study injected 270 people with virus that causes the common cold. Those with strong social connections did not get as sick, did not get as sick as long, and this last one produced less mucus than those who were in a group that was connected. <laughs> who tested that? I mean, did they look at their Kleenex? I had to throw that one in there. <laughs> Sorry. And you know, that's all you're going to remember from this talk. Okay, so... All this talk about groups begs the question, does this any group work? Well, any group do. And I, you know, I'd, I'd say anything's better than nothing. I would suggest you over the course of your life, you need to look back over your shoulder and see basically two groups operative in your life for you had the most maximum spiritual impact on you and other people. Two groups. One is a closed group. I do believe in closed groups. I believe that there needs to be a, a season of life where you are tracking with people. And it's the same people, typically the same gender, it's closed, meaning there's not people coming in. It's small, high transparency, high, straight talk. It's raw. you got to have that. It's, it's some seasons of your life you need that. If you don't have that, then, well, the answer might be in your open group. So you need a closed group. I really do believe that. I've seen that. I'm test driving. So I've done several over the year. I'm doing several right now. And i got to tell you, it's, I've missed it. And then your open group. You need an open group. An open group is defined by a group that can expect new people at any moment. Typically, the people that make up your closed group come out of your open group. Now, this is one of the—I mean, this is one of the reasons I am here. I want to describe to you the level of open groups that I believe, and statistically, I'll prove this in a moment, have the greatest impact on your life. Okay. There's a spectrum of groups, open groups. The first group is what I call Bible study. It's just a data dump. It's, to be honest, it's what I'm doing right now. I'm just giving you information. 
It's, I'm, I'm sharing you what I learned in a commentary, and I'm just dumping on you, and God can use that. And then the group next to that is, is a group that stays the Bible, but they like hanging out with each other. They just enjoy each other. They're, they get along, and you know, they, they do things outside of class or group. And then there's this third group. And let me say this, much: these are not sharp delineations. They bleed. And there's a third group that stays the Bible. They like hanging out with each other, but they have a structure for care. They, have a, they, have, they minister to each other. Whether the, the prayer requests don't all fall on one person. They have a, they pray, you get the picture. And then there's this, this fourth group, or whatever group I'm on. They actually have an outward orientation. They have a psychology and a culture of outreach. They wear name tags. They are thinking of people who are not here yet. Who can we reach? Who, you know, gosh, they have, they have structure to reach people. They talk about it. And then our last group over here is, um, this is a group that does all these things, but this group is a sending group. This group actually has the audacity to think that we can start more groups like ours. Generally speaking, as you move down the spectrum over here, this group has the far greatest impact on you personally and on the life of the church because you go from maintenance to mission. Um, we're going to have a guy come here this fall, I think in September. His name is Josh Hunt. He did a study of a thousand groups. And he asked this question, on-campus groups, off-campus groups, and all demographics across the United States. He said, what is the purpose of your groups? And they had several options. One of the options was is to study the Bible and grow spiritually. One of the other options was to reach new people for Christ. And there were several of them, but those were two of the options. The groups that answered our purpose for, was to reach people for Christ had higher levels of spiritual vibrancy in terms of giving, joy, parenting, marriage. It was off the scale versus the groups who said their purpose was to grow spiritually. See, I would think it was the opposite. Something happens when you're going and you're attempting to reach people. You have a, I believe you have a special presence of God in a way that's different from groups who are just going to study the Bible. Let me demonstrate this another way. This is going to sound weird, but bear with me. Let's say God came up to me and Jill and said, listen, you're going to die on Wednesday. But you got two days to find the family that raises your kids. Okay, good. What are we going to look for? Well, I mean, just off the top of my head, I'm, I'm going to look for someone who's like-minded, right? You know, someone who's going to raise my kids like I want them, that's going to have the that's going to love the Lord, who's going to teach them. And, and so I, I'm looking for someone with like-minded values. This is common sense, right? I'm going to look for someone who's going to take care of them, right? Who's going, to, who's going to provide for them until they can launch on their own. You guys know where I'm going with this, right? And guys, I'm an evil father, and I want that for my kids. How much more does God want to send his kids to a place that's going to disciple them well and is going to show them what it means to be a disciple? I believe that's true in the body of Christ. I want to end with two stories. When I was writing my notes, they made sense, so just bear with me. Um, and I'll connect the dots, so just indulge me for a moment. When I first got to this church five years ago, one of the things I do, uh, and it drives my assistant nuts, is I'm always looking for people, and you're out there right now, I don't know you, who, who come to church, church, but never end up in a group. And there's lots of them, actually. And we have ways of finding out who you are. I feel like a detective. And so what I end up doing is I get these names, and I kind of farm it and mine it, and then I reach out to these people. And some of them are actually on your class rolls. And uh, I reach out to them personally, and I email them. And sometimes, I'll, it depends on the, the month, I'll get 15 names, 20 names. Well, not long after I got here, uh, there's about 25 names, so I emailed them all out. Personally, I don't do a, you know, a cattle call thing. And I say, hey, listen, I see you're here at the church. And we, this is an absolute shot in the dark. But would you be interested in trying a group, just you know, sticking your toe in the water and trying it this next year, this next month? And typically what happens is, is I won't hear. I get a bunch of bad emails back or, um, or, uh, or nothing. This one time I got several people responded. 
Um, but this one guy responded. I'll never forget it. He was incredibly candid with me. He said, I, I, I appreciate what you're doing, Ross. Um, and, uh, but I know what you're doing. <laughs> I need to tell you about myself. And so you'll better understand why I'm not in a group. So he, he begins to, this is two, three paragraphs. He said, I'm an executive at a large company. I've got lots of people under me. I deal with people all week long. I do presentations. I'm interacting. And he said, when I come to church, the last thing I want to do is talk to anybody. He goes, I just want to sit and veg. I don't want to have to make conversation. So he ends the email with this. And besides all that, I don't need it. Pretty candid, right? I mean, I was ready to fire an email off. I was like, eh. So put the clutch in for a moment and just hold that story. He ends with, I don't need it. And I immediately thought back to a, a story that happened at my first church I served at. So just hold on, bear with me. When I was at Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, uh, we had a lady named Rita Hedquist. It was a very large church, and she was the hostess. We had a full-time hostess. All she did was funerals and weddings and things. Right about the time I got there, um, her husband passed away. He had a protracted uh, battle with cancer, and he passed away. And Rita was a, just a wonderful guy later. Her husband was a wonderful man. He was a very successful executive, left her lots of money, life insurance, and all her, grand, all her children were in the area. And so she had her children, she had her grandchildren, and house paid off. It was just a, it was as good a situation as you can imagine when you lose your husband. And she was in her early 60s. And so she had, all, she had a great group of ladies who were supporting her. And one day she's walking down the hall, and our pastor at the time was Adrian Rogers. And um, he, he did Rita's husband's funeral, and he, he saw Rita, and he I said, Rita, how are you doing? And she's like, you know, considering everything, I'm doing really well. I, I, it, it could be worse. And he's like, oh, that's great to hear. <laughs> and then he did something that was incredibly uncharacteristic of him. He looks at her and he says, are you dating anybody? <laughs> okay, if you knew Adrian Rogers, my pastor, he was 70-something at the time. That didn't happen. A man did not ask a single woman if she's dating especially your pastor. So she says it. She's just like, oh, Dr. Rogers. You know, she's like, oh, she's all ruffled. And she's one of these Southern Belle kind of ladies. I mean, she was like, oh, I don't talk to a man about that. And, and she was just, this is my pastor, man. I am, you know, I just looked up for years and he's asking me whether I'm dating. And she's just flabbergasted. And, she, and he's looking at her. He's not saying anything. And she's just like, Dr. Rogers, I don't need anybody. And he goes, hmm. He said, well, maybe someone needs you and just walks off. And she's sitting there like, what was that? This is my pa-. He just And he just walks off and walks off to his car or gets lunch or whatever. What I didn't tell you is earlier that morning, she had gotten a call from the accountant in the church who were good friends with her and her husband for, before he died and said, Rita, we want to take you to dinner. We just want to love on you. And she's like, oh, that's great. But we want to tell you something. We want to be full, full disclosure. There's another guy coming with us that lost his wife years ago to cancer. And she's like, no, 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 no. I know what you're trying to do. And I appreciate it, but no thanks. So she goes back to her computer, and she's sitting there. And what Dr. Rogers said just is sticking in her crawl. She just can't get out of her mind. She picks the phone up. She calls him back and says, listen, I'm going to go to that dinner very reluctantly and against my better judgment, but I'm going to go. So she went. She gets to dinner, and she's talking to this guy. He's not halfway bad. He's kind of normal, actually. At the end of dinner, he said, Rita, can I, can I have your phone number? Can we talk? And she's just like, oh, yeah, I guess so. You know the rest of the story, don't you? They got married. I know that story because I interviewed her for a Valentine's banquet. At the end of that story, she looks up at me, tears coming down her eyes, and she goes, you know what? 
someone needed me. And you know what else? I needed them. Rita had 20 years left, probably a good 20. That was 15 years ago. She had 20 years left of her life, and she was content to live it with the idea that no one needed her, and she didn't need anybody. She was wrong. The moral to the story is this. Someone needs you, and you need somebody. That is how the body of Christ works. It's Paul's favorite analogy to describe the church. The body needs each other, even if you don't even know. You could be sitting there going, I don't need anybody. (laughs) No one needs me. That's not how it works. I am so glad certain people stayed in the game and did not have that perspective. Your whole staff would not be sitting here today if people had had that perspective. I am the beneficiary of people who said, you know what? Someone needs me, and I need them. I need you. My family needs you. So if nothing else, someone needs you, and you need them.